all the files, the sample files that I'm going to talk about in the presentation are online on, on um, Vesta, Cetus, and Mira. Right, for the moment you're probably um, mostly interested in Vesta and Cetus. In this directory, tilde rloy, that's my directory, slash public, slash ATP ESC 2014, there are a couple of sample, there's a sample uh, program, a sample make file, uh, other, the, the um, and that's what we'll use on the hands-on, but that directory also has um, a PDF of uh, these slides in it if you need them for a reference. So you could, if you're able to log in already, you can download them, uh, get a copy there, and then they'll eventually be posted on the, uh, uh, the workshop uh, website, but that's where they are right now. So uh, let me just say a few words about um, using your crypto card. Uh, so as you saw in the instructions, and if you've logged in already, um, you know that you need to type your PIN followed by the string that's displayed in the crypto card. So that's a hex string, and the letters in there need to be typed in capitals, right? So just remember that. You need to either use caps lock or um, to uh, hold the shift key. And if you forget, that's a um, common cause of not failing to log in. And um, I just wanted to mention sort of what I'd recommend as um, procedure uh, if you fail to log in the first time that um, you, uh, you type in your crypto string. You may have just typed one of the letters wrong, right? That's a common thing because it's not echoing them because it's a password, so you can't see what you typed. You can try the same string again. The other end doesn't know what, as long as it didn't match, the other end doesn't know that the string you're working on has been used up already. It only, math, you know, it only advances the random sequence when you match it. So the first thing you should just try is just type, try typing it again because maybe you just didn't get it right the first time. Uh, it's not that, you know, when you t if you were to type it wrong, it doesn't invalidate what you're looking at on your card. So um, if you fail a second time, um, it's a good idea to think, you know, is the machine down today? Maybe you should check that out. Uh, you know, maybe you forgot. Uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, if uh, otherwise, there could be a transient problem with the login on that particular machine. Who knows? Occasionally these things happen. So try logging into a different ALCF host that you know that you have access to because once you have a successful login, it doesn't matter on which uh, machine because they all go through the same uh, crypto server. Uh, once you have a successful login, it resets your count of failures. And why is that important? Because if you fail to log in too many times, your account gets disabled. And there isn't any really visible sign that it's been disabled other than uh, you, you type your password and it doesn't let you in. Um, because, you know, if we actually told you, then that would be like giving too much information to hackers, you know, that they would give up. So. Um, if you are trying to connect and you don't get any response at all and you fire up your web browser and you can't reach anl.gov, that is an indication that something more serious is wrong, that the, uh, perhaps the IP that you're coming from has actually been blacklisted by our site-wide firewall. So like if you can access um, the ANL web page from a different host but you can't access it from, let's say, your desk machine, that's a sign to, to ask us to investigate uh, why uh, that it seems to be blacklisted. Okay, so those are, those are some tips. As, um, you know, always if you're stuck, you send us, uh, send support, uh, some mail, we'll help you investigate it. But I hope that um, these tips will help you avoid uh, trouble uh, and at least get you to, uh, um, uh, the point where uh, the simple, you avoid the simple problems. Okay, you're logged in now. So, uh, on our system, <clears throat> your environment, your path that controls which compilers you get and uh, which tools are available to you, uh, software tools, 
It's controlled by a system called SoftEnv. If you've used uh, a cluster or a, a machine um, at another location and it had something called modules, this is something similar to modules. It doesn't matter if you haven't used modules. But uh, what SoftEnv is, is um, there's a file in your home directory called .soft. Okay, .soft is the um, file used by the BlueGene systems. If you happen to be using the visualization cluster Tukey later, that one uses a slightly different name, .soft.tukey. Uh, but the contents are the same kind of contents. It's a file that just has some uh, keys in it. So a key is something like plus MPI wrapper dash XL. That key, um, this file is read by the system whenever you log in and it sees the keys. Uh, so in this example, MPI wrapper dash XL is a key to select the IBM XL compilers rather than, let's say, the GNU compilers. Um, and then at default puts all of the other default tools into your path. So uh, when you log in, um, the SoftEnv system automatically looks at this file, it sets up your path, and then when you get your shell, these things are in your path. So it uh, is meant to um, save you from, um, allow you to make some choices about uh, things that you want uh, in, uh, in a fairly simple way. But um, so when you first log in, you probably will only have a file that contains at default. So you will want to put in a key to choose your compilers like the MPI wrapper XL one. And uh, on the next slide, I'll show you the alternatives. Now, when you do modify that file, your environment just doesn't magically change. You have to tell the system to reprocess your .soft file. So there's a command called resoft. It's actually a shell alias uh, that will refresh your environment. The alternative is you could log out and log back in again. When you log back in again, it'll read the file again, and uh, then you're, you're good to go. Okay, so um, generally speaking, uh, you'll, you'll know when you need to put another key in here. If you're looking to use one of the debuggers or something like that, the instructions for it will say put this key in your .soft and so you'll know what to do. Okay, so um, there are three families of compilers that are available on the system. Um, we generally recommend starting with the IBM XL compilers and that corresponds to that key plus MPI wrapper dash XL. But if you would like to use the GNU compilers, uh, you can. And in, instead of the MPI wrapper XL key, use the MPI wrapper GCC key. And um, uh, if you'd like to use Clang, there's MPI wrapper VG Clang. So um, the compiler wrapper names, when you use those keys, they, these will be put in your path. Uh, the, they're, they're, uh, such as uh, names such as MPI XLC for you know, regular C, MPI XLC XX for C++, and, and so on, F77, F90, 95, et cetera. You, can, um, uh, you should be aware that um, with the XL compilers, if you're compiling threaded code, that you need to use the version of the compiler wrapper that has the underscore R suffix such as MPI XLC underscore R. Uh, otherwise, it won't generate thread safe code, and who knows what will happen when it runs. Um, so um, just be aware of that. Um, and um, you don't want to specify more than one of these keys. Um, probably the last one will have effect, but I can't really guarantee what will happen. I would just recommend coming, commenting out the one that you're not using at the moment and only have one. And um, um, also be aware that uh, some of these wrappers, because of the way they're implemented, um, you, there may be some slightly unexpected effects. Uh, so um, you can see I listed here that if you're using the GNU compilers uh, that we suggested using MPICC. Well, the wrapper for the XL compilers, uh, MPI XLC, 
if you happen to be choosing the GNU key, MPI XLC will actually also give you the GNU compiler, uh, which you wouldn't quite expect. So, but if you uh, if you use the sensible name, you'll get the sensible thing. Um, and uh, if you have any doubts, of course, just run the compiler with dash dash version or dash q ver q version, and you'll you know when try both of those, and you'll you'll see from the output what compiler's hooked up to the other end, um, you know, what is actually in your path. So, but for starters, you can probably just choose MPI wrapper XL and move on. Okay, so um, we have, we've logged in, we have our environment, uh, we uh, compile, let's say, with MPI XLC. Um, now, um, we need to, we want, we want to run our executable, and uh, for that we'll need to use the queuing system, which is called Cobalt, right? Cobalt is a similar kind of queuing system to PBS, if you've used PBS before. There are some differences, the commands are not quite the same, but it's very similar, it serves the same function, uh, that, um, you know, you will submit a batch job, and. Uh, for a certain number of nodes and for a certain amount of time. Uh, and there's also billing information about what project it will be billed to. And uh, when the, when the um, slot on the machine is available, then your job will run. So how do you submit that job? Well, here's a, a script, a shell script, that will run a very simple job. And in this particular example, I put the queuing options in the script in the first line there where it says hash cobalt. So I'll talk about those options on the next slide. Um, but uh, they, the, um, well, I'll, actually, it's a simple set, so let me just talk about it here. This one, in, this one is asking for dash n32, so it says I want 32 nodes for this job, and dash t30 is 30 minutes. And then uh, I'm going to submit it to the queue called queue.atpesc, which is the queue that we've set up for this workshop. Um, uh, that queue name is valid on Vesta and Cetus, but it is not valid on Mira. On Mira, you would uh, just use the default queue. So I made a note about that on the uh, next slide. And um, your project allocation, um, there's one set up for this workshop also, that's called ATP ESC 2014. So, <clears throat> um, now the command that actually starts your MPI program to run on this machine is called run job, right? This corresponds to other systems where you would use MPI run or MPI exec. Run job is the blue gene equivalent. So, uh, its arguments are um, the ones that are the most important are um, how many ranks do you want, right? How many MPI ranks do you want? That's dash dash NP here, and I've asked for 32. And um, if you're not familiar with MPI, that's what we're gonna cover tomorrow, but that's how many copies of it will be run in parallel that are all gonna talk to each other. And um, the dash P16 is the number of ranks per node. So I'll, I'll come back and talk about this. So these are parameters that select um, kind of what the job will look like on the hardware. And the location within the machine that it runs is given by dash dash block cobalt part name. Now that environment variable is set by cobalt in the environment before the script runs. So you don't fill that in with something. That's going to get filled in at the at the time, in other words, when your job gets to the head of the queue, Cobalt is gonna say, I have this spot here where I'm gonna run your job. It sets that environment variable to point to there and then it runs your script and your script has to run into that partition. Otherwise, uh, it's, you, you know, you, that's where you're allowed to run. If you uh, try to run somewhere else, the run job will fail. Um, then finally on that line, you have colon hello MPI, that's the name of the test program. And uh, so colon separates the run job arguments from the uh, 
your program and its arguments, right? If you wanted to put arguments to your program, you just put them after, the, after where the hello MPI is. And then the last uh, line in this JavaScript is just return zero to say that um, it was successful, right? If you had some kind of error handling in there, you could uh, return a non-zero status and then Cobalt would know that you failed. And uh, in just a simple standalone job, it, it doesn't matter a lot, but if you're chaining jobs together in a sequence, the um, return status uh, is important. Um, so um, let's see, some points about uh, your job script. Uh, notice that some of these arguments are single dashes and some of them are double. Unfortunately, PowerPoint has this nasty habit of munging the uh, double dashes into one, but I think uh, for the 15th time I fixed all of them. So uh, dash dash NP is a, is a double dash. And uh, on this page, the others are singles. Um, oh, dash dash block is also two dashes. Right, and um, um, so I think it's pretty clear from this example that if you just put another run job command after the first one, after the first one was done, it would just run the second one. So you could put a whole bunch of them in sequence and they would just run one after the other, assuming that there was enough time left before the job ran, right? If you're 30 minutes, right, this one asked for 30 minutes, if that runs out, then Cobalt's just gonna kill everything, it's gonna exit, and you know, wherever you were at the moment, at the time that you ran out of time, uh, it will just get killed. Um, okay. Um, uh, so where does the output of your program go? Well, when you, when this thing does run, by default, right, as soon as you submit it, it's going to have a job ID. It'll print out a number that has the job ID. And by default, you'll see immediately, you'll see that job ID dot cobalt log, and that will show you all the parameters corresponding to how it was submitted. Uh, and um, when it actually starts running, there'll be some more information in the cobalt log added about where, what partition it was assigned to and so forth. The output will, the standard output will come out in the job ID, in other words, let's say the job ID is 123, okay? You'll get 123.cobalt.log, and then when it actually starts, you'll get 123.output is the file that will have the standard out, and 123.error is the file that will have the standard error. And you can change that prefix from the job ID to something else, and you just give it an argument dash big O, right? But that's not, that's uh, just a customization that you can do. What if you redirect the output? Hmm? What if you redirect the output? Um, in, of the run job command? If you, so, so the, um, the jobs uh, standard out and standard error applies to um, basically the, the shell scripts standard out and standard error if you don't redirect it from within the script. And uh, if you apply a, a shell redirection to the run job command, it'll go exactly where you expect it. It won't go to where um, the, uh, the jobs output is. It'll go to wherever you redirect. It, it will do what you think it will. Um, but this is um, where the job scripts output will go. So if you don't redirect everything, that's where it will come out there. And uh, it's flexible. You can. Um, so how do you submit this? Well, the example I just gave, it had the submission parameters built into the script in that hash cobalt um, comment. It's like a special comment. It's like hash PBS if you used PBS. Um, that one can be submitted by just saying if, the, if that script were called jobscript.sh, you could just do qsub jobscript.sh. Everything else is known from looking at the script. But um, sometimes you don't want to specify everything in the script itself. You can just specify um, the uh, fields on the actual Q sub line uh, and then point it to the script as well. So anything that you put um, on the Q sub line uh, will override what's uh, in the script. Um, 
in some cases it might, if there's a kind of a nonsensical conflict, it might give you an error message or something. So, you, you know, not everything should be specified uh, in two ways. Uh, but like, for example, you might not want to hard code the Q name into the script, and then when you do Q sub, you might want to just say Q sub dash Q or whatever, whatever Q. But normally, um, you know, for this class, you're going to submit to the um, workshop Q, the ATP ESC, uh, the Q dot ATP ESC Q. Um, but uh, normally, if you're, there isn't something special set up, you would just submit to the default queue, and you don't actually even have to say what the name of the queue is. It, but by default, it goes to the queue default. So, um, let's see. Your script needs to be executable. It needs to, you know, you need to do a chmod plus x on your executable. Otherwise, it'll say, hey, I, I can't run this because it's not executable. And um, uh, there are plenty of options for qsub, so you can just do a man qsub and check them out. Question? Is there a time limit to what we can submit to the default queue? Well, okay, that's a very good question. Um, in general, there's a whole queuing policy that's on our web page, and you can read it. And it's about two pages long. And um, the short answer is depending, so the short answer is the maximum job length is 24 hours. However, um, different length jobs up to 24 hours uh, d depending on a job's size and length, it will get treated differently in terms of priority. So, for example, um, if it's less than uh, six hours, um, then uh, it is um, uh, a job uh, can schedule anywhere on the machine. Um, but if it's um, more than six hours and it's a small job, then uh, it gets sort of a lower priority than the big jobs because we need to um, make room to run large. We need to give pri the the machine's um, major goal is to run large programs at scale, and we can't do that if uh, we are continually trying to drain for uh, small jobs. And small jobs that run a long time block out the big ones for a long time, so they get. Um, uh, relatively lesser priority. What about on Vesta, which is uh, the main machine that we're using? Yeah, so that, um, the policy I'm just talking about applies to Mira, which is the main production machine. The, the uh, Vesta and uh, Cetus are more geared towards um, debugging and short runs, not production scale work. Uh, so um, uh, do a QSTAT dash capital Q and that will tell you the maximum um, submission time. I think it might be two hours, one hour. Okay, so you've submitted your job and it's in the queue, so how do you find out what's going on? You do a queue stat, we'll show you everything in the entire, uh, in all jobs in the machine for all queues and all users. If you say queue stat dash u, you'll just get your jobs. If you know your job ID already and you just want to check up on it, QSTAT and that number. Uh, if you want the detailed information about your job, for example, when you submitted it and where its working directory is and stuff like that, you can say QSTAT-FL and the job ID and you'll get a very long list of all of the properties of that job. And then uh, suppose that you either uh, changed your mind about the job or it's uh, stuck or something and you want to get rid of it, QDEL is what to do. And uh, if you're sitting there wondering why your job isn't running, you might want to check if there's a reservation on the machine. Uh, so the command show res will show you uh, reservations on the machine that can shed some light on what's going on. Uh-huh. Is there no like account limit? Any person can submit anything they want to, like you don't have to have an account to submit it to? If you don't have an active um, allocation of compute hours, then you can't submit something. So that's what the dash big A ATP ESC 2014 is for. Uh, or if you have another project, you know, discretionary or inside or whatever. As jobs sit in the queue, their score grows and uh, Cobalt tries to run the job with the highest score in the machine. So when you do QSTAT, you'll see the scores. And, uh, um, you know, a full job, full machine job would have to reach the top of the queue to start draining 
everything else to fit it in, right? Because nothing else can run at the same time. Do you, do you have a command, like if we think about starting a job, do you have a command to just type that one and give you, okay, if you ask for a job of, let's say, 32 nodes or something, how long it might take? No, there isn't. Because of the way the score growth works on Cobalt, it's not um, entirely deterministic how it will go. Um, if you look at what's in the queue, you can get a general idea of the jobs with scores higher than yours. But the thing is, different classes of jobs grow, their score growth, their score grows at a different rate than others. So it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to predict. So, um, okay, so that's your basic submit a job and then eventually it'll run. What happens if you have a bunch of small things for testing or maybe you need some kind of a debugging session? There is a way to submit what's called an interactive job. And what you do is you, um, uh, you, need to, uh, you, you need to decide how many nodes and how long you want this for and then you use the dash capital I argument. And um, um, you, you also need the queue and, and your allocation if you haven't uh, specified it some other way. Um, and uh, I think I kind of glossed over it a few slides back, but if you set the uh, environment variable cobalt underscore proj, it's down here, um, then that becomes the default project that you Q sub against. So if you only have one project, if you type the command projects, it'll tell you what projects you're attached to. Um, if you only have one project and you do a Q sub, it will take that project. But if you have more than one, it doesn't know which one to pick. So this will, get, this will tell it which one to pick by default. And so if you are generally working on uh, one particular project, you can set that variable in your bash or C or whatever, and then you won't have to uh, keep typing it. And uh, it's a it's a big help. So you submit this, and you still have to go through the queue. So you want to pick parameters for your job that are going to be satisfied fairly quickly, right? Something not too long and uh, in a queue, you know, of the size and whatever that's not too, for, for the workshop, you don't have to worry about it because you're going to run quick. So it will just sit there until that job would have run. Then you'll get a, another shell prompt. Um, at the moment, that shell prompt doesn't look any different than the one you just had, but it is, in fact, a new shell. And the way you can tell is if you look at the, if you, if you say, uh, you know, echo dollar cobalt job ID, it will have the job ID set in its environment. And that, and uh, more importantly, cobalt part name, which is that argument you need for run job. So once you have this shell prompt, um, you can just type the run job command exactly the way you would have put it into your job script. Right, so, you know, for example. And uh, you can just, you know, if it's uh, stuck or something, you can control C it, it'll kill it, you can run another one. The job doesn't go away until it either runs out of time or you type exit in that shell. Now, what happens if you run out of time, unfortunately right now you don't get a message saying you ran out of time. But what will happen is if you do a run job, it will fail very quickly uh, saying something about, you know, an authentication failed or something like that. So if you get, uh, a failure for it to start up at all, then uh, do a QStat and check on your job ID and see if it's gone. Right? The shell won't go away because if you were editing a file or something in that shell, then you wouldn't want to lose it. And so we decided to not have the shell just you know, be killed right away. So hopefully um, uh, we'll be able to get it to print out a message saying that you uh, ran out of time. Uh, but you can check uh, manually. Are there any restrictions on uh, any time limits on the? It, it's it's a normal job. It just gives you the prompt um, directly uh, instead of taking the input out of a script. Uh, so anything that applies for a regular job applies to that. So, yep. Are these slides going to be available like before our first session? Yeah. So I I um if you go to the um, directory tilde r loy slash public slash ATP ESC 2014. 
the sample files and the PDF of these slides, at least um, modulo a few tweaks I made, uh, are there right now on either machine. I, when I see either, um, CDIS and Mirror are on the same file system, so that's one. There's a copy there and there's a copy on Vesta. So you can just grab the um, PDF with, uh, you know, rsync or SCP or something. Okay, so before in the job script, uh, I was talking about um, nodes and how many ranks and uh, uh, how many um, uh, ranks per node and so forth. And so I just wanted to say a few words about, well, how do you decide what you want to do? So, um, right, we were just talking about the minimum set of nodes you can get on any given machine. And uh, on Vesta, which is the primary resource for this workshop, um, you can get a block of nodes that's as small as 32, um, uh, 32 nodes. So each node has 16 cores and some memory. Now, you get to choose how that gets laid out with respect to MPI ranks. In other words, an MPI rank is a process. A, a process is one or more threads that will share a memory, you know, a spot in memory. So, for example, in, in my example, I said mode P16. That means take the memory of that node, divide it into 16 pieces, and give one piece to each core, and then they're each going to run independently. Okay, so we'll run one copy of the program, in other words, one MPI rank per core, and there'll be 16, 16 of those on a node. So your total number of rank, if you're consistent, I mean, you have to be consistent for the whole job. If you are running uh, 16 ranks per node, right, then the maximum number of ranks you can run in is 16 times the number of nodes that you, that you asked for. Okay, and the, what, if you don't, uh, if you submit a job for, let's say, uh, 32 nodes, and you only um, um, ask to really use 16, then those other 16 will just sit idle. And just be aware that when you're in that situation that your job will get charged for everything that was allocated for you. So in other words, if you ask for 32 nodes and you only run on one, you're getting charged for 32 because you have, you know, and but there are several factors here, right? There's only a minimum size that we can give you because that's a physical property of the machine. Uh, but um, so it's understandable if you're running some small test that, you know, you use two and uh, you've asked for 32, but you're only going to use two nodes. Uh, but the point here is that you don't want to ask for a thousand nodes and then run on two. That's kind of pointless. Now, when you ask for a certain number of nodes, um, the dash n argument of Q sub, um, it's going to round it up to the next possible value that exists because there are no partitions, for example, on Vesta that are 33 nodes. The next size up from 32 is 64, right? So keep that in mind. Um, and um, so going back to the example of um, choosing mode P16, uh, dash P16, which puts, divides the memory into 16 pieces, one core for each. That core supports up to four threads, but unless your code is um, threaded, you're only going to have one thread, right? All thread creation is done through either um, OpenMP or pthreads, which is something active you need to do. So, um, for example, if you chose one MPI rank on a node, it doesn't subdivide the memory at all, and all 16 cores, uh, which can run a total of 64 threads, all of those are available to your one MPI rank. But until your MPI rank actually does something to create more than one thread, they'll all be idle. 
but they're, they're ready for you. Right, so in between, you have um, options like you could say four ranks per node that would divide the memory into four pieces. There'd be four cores associated with each rank and initially just running that master thread for the MPI rank. Okay, so the more, um, so for just uh, getting started, you probably just want to choose mode uh, 16, one rank per core. Um, but you, you know, you could in theory uh, run up to 64 ranks per node. And uh, when you are asking for more than 16 ranks per node, uh, it's actually implementing it using those hardware threads. And what happens is um, you, um, you won't, if, if you're running in mode dash P64, there are no extra threads available in the hardware per MPI rank, so you can't spawn any threads. They're just, there's nothing left. You've tapped it out. So it doesn't, in other words, it doesn't do uh, arbitrary thread scheduling. Uh, the thread uh, only within the four hardware, supported hardware threads per core. Um, so, um, right, so, um, on this slide, right, I've recapped that the, uh, what the minimum partition size is. Generally, um, you, the partition sizes are powers of two from that number up. So on Vesta, you can go 32, 64, 128, um, up to the whole machine, which is 2K. Right. So same kind of thing on CETAs, 128, 256, and so on. So, on Mira, the actual hardware size of the partitions is actually the same as CDIS, it was 128, but for practical reasons, because the machine is so big, we don't allow uh, jobs smaller than 512 nodes to run, so for all practical purposes, it's 512. Uh, in fact, it's not even possible to um, boot those um, blocks, the smaller blocks, uh, independently, uh, the way we have things set up. So, um, okay. Um, I am just going to mention OpenMP because this, I, I, I thought that this would be a, a good reference slide for you later when uh, they talk about how to write OpenMP code. Um, the main thing here is that um, when you're um, Compiling an OpenMP code with the Excel compilers, remember, I, I mentioned this at the beginning, but I'll just mention it again, is you need to use the version of the compiler wrapper that has the underscore R on the end. So instead of MPI XLC, you need to use MPI XLC underscore R, right? Otherwise, it won't generate the right code. And um, uh, you... Um, I should also mention you need to enable it with a particular compiler option, but let, let me update the slide uh, with an example. And uh, um, the other thing is that uh, OpenMP programs need an environment variable. Typically, they tell them how many threads per rank to create. And that's specified by a variable called OMP underscore num underscore threads. And um, the way you specify an environment variable, it won't just if you set it in your shell environment, it won't just end up in the batch job, right? You need to tell it explicitly that you want this environment in the batch job. And so in that run job command in your script, um, add uh, this dash dash ends. It uh, made the dash dash into one here. Uh, and put OMP num threads equals whatever value it is. So this particular example is really just a test. Um, it only needs one node, right? I'm asking for 16 ranks at 16 ranks per node, and uh, in each rank I'm going to run four threads. So this is it's just a little test, but it will max out uh, one node. Okay, so um, that's the end of my slides. I, I had a lot to pack into uh, 11 slides here. But um, I'd like to encourage you to um, just copy that directory that I pointed you to at the beginning.
And uh, there's uh, the sample files there. And uh, really all you need to do is to type make and then Q sub in the name of the job script, and it will submit something for you. So if you log into Vesta, you could do that. Uh, uh, and uh, let me know if there are any problems. I'll walk around and uh, help you out. <laughs>